I'm Ruben Gonzalez. I compete in the Luge and the, in the Winter Olympics. Up to this point, uh, my, my Everest has been making the Olympics. When I was 21, I was watching the Olympics on TV, and I saw Scott Hamilton win the gold medal. He's about five feet tall. I thought, man, if that little guy can do it, I can too. I just got to find the sport. The reason I chose the luge was because my strong suit was always perseverance. My nickname was Bulldog. And so I thought, I got to find something with a lot of broken bones, and maybe it'll be a lot of quitters, and I just won't quit. I'll outlast it. You have to want something badly enough to stick around while the going gets tough, because it's always tough at the beginning. What kept me going was that Olympic dream. Those two weeks are magical, and it's worth doing anything for four years to get them. Last year, I got the itch again. I thought, you know, I wonder if this whole body can still handle it. I'm, I'm 47. I'm coming to the end of my sporting career, and so I've got new Everest to climb. In fact, my future Everest is to, uh, to, to make the Olympics its fourth time. No one's ever done four Olympics in four different decades. Uh, not in the Winter Olympics, and uh, I intend to be the first. Hello. Hey. Can you hear me okay? How are you? Yeah, run. that's how this morning's video came about. We were supposed to meet at a coffee shop, and it was uh, closed down. Then we tried Starbucks. That was closed. And so he said, well, we just go to, you know, to the winery, because it's a couple of miles away. And so... It was spur of the moment. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm sure it probably that was, it was probably an even better environment than the other two locations that you were probably going to have it at. Oh, yeah. I mean, for him it was work, but for me, it, he was he was telling me all this stuff. I'm sure he had fun, but uh, no, I had a blast. I mean, I'd, I'd been there before, but um, it's always I. You can tell. I mean, I, I just get pumped up when I get to talking to entrepreneurs. And he makes wines that taste so good. I've told you guys all about it. And when we first met, he he was a COO at a nonprofit. We met a couple of years ago. And, and when we got to talking, I thought, you know what? This is an entrepreneur that still has a job, okay? And then he started telling me about some classes he took in, in college. And, uh, boy, look at what you can do in a couple of years. Why don't you give us two? How did you go from, from COO to this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been actually a home brewer for about 10 years. I started sharing it with people, and then they started asking me where they could buy it. And I'm like, well, I can't really sell it to you, but if I did, how much would you pay? And that kind of birthed the idea of, well, what if I started a like a brewery or a winery, right? <laughs> you know. So um, one of the things that I actually made is a wine from lemons, not grapes. And so we just call them adult lemonades. Uh, a lot of that was birthed out of that class you, you were uh, mentioning, right? Uh, it was a chemistry brewing class, and out of that, we just started like making all types of crazy uh, adult beverages. Very cool. Now, I, we're, we're starting here because, look, every time I see Matthew, he's got something new. Check out this car. I mean, is that sweet or what? And marketing drives his business, okay? Absolutely. Yeah. So how important would you say, you know, and, and oh. where'd you learn the marketing? Oh, I would say that branding and marketing is number one. Uh, you need to have great branding and marketing, and you need to have a good product. Obviously not a terrible product. You'd love a great product, but when I started off, I, I just wanted great branding and marketing, and if I had a decent product, that was okay. Now, cool. it turned out to be better than decent. Yeah. How'd you find this little guy, this little blue guy over here? He's, he's, he's like the started all the marketing. Yeah, so um, he's actually called our skier pee guy. Um, <laughs> so, skier pee. Yeah, so yeah, if you can sell skier pee, I tell you, you are a good marketer, absolutely. man. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, my snarky teenage son came up with that. Name. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then my daughter actually designed our first label. So she's the one that came up with all of that. Family business, okay? Yeah, he, yeah. he kept everybody involved. Homeschooler, just like us, mm. uh, strong Christian. And I guess that's how we met. Uh, I'm not even sure who introduced us, but uh, but same values, right? I mean, values are huge, guys. Uh, they will drive what you do, so you have to know whatever your values are. I'm not saying, you know, whatever your values are, you got to know what they are. It's like some old Greek guy said, know thyself, right? Well, let me step inside. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. This guy's got so much cool stuff. I love this. I love, sh I get excited when I meet people that are entrepreneurs because, uh, you know, I are one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You want to 
want to just kind of yeah okay don't, yeah don't so you it. walk in you know what he does to make people happy look you walk in look who you see right away i mean how can you not smile with, with mr <laughs> elf there right everything's exactly. elf yeah, funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look he's got the cop he, he's got the bottles here see everything's the same branding uh i'm about to taste this here what well, this is his latest product uh it's for the winter and tell it how did that come about? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was really fun. So my wife for the last 30 years have been, has been making a cranberry holiday tea. And uh, a couple years ago, she said, well, what if we actually blended it and mixed it with our product? Um, and so it's our, our lemon wine with cranberry, cinnamon, and cloves. Oh, oh it's just... It, I can't it, wait. It, to, it, it's, it's Christmas in a cup. You know what? I'm, I'm 10 minutes away from my house. I was going to go run some errands in Monument. But I, I'm serious. I'm gonna drive straight home. I gotta start making some phone calls anyway, so I I, I need some other stuff. There yeah, yeah, you go. <laughs> we'll go inside back. Have you ever been in a brewery or a winery? This is a winery, okay? Yeah. Okay, here we go. So. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we do everything uh, by uh, by scratch and by hand. So if we look over here, these are our uh, our 100 gallon uh, gallon fermenters that we actually got from uh, Germany, um, and. Everything is uh, done uh, small batch. Small batch, yep. And uh, then this thing, <laughs> yeah. this thing is so cool. Yeah. Look. Yeah, so this is our uh, our five hundred dollar uh, <laughs> manual uh, bottler that we got from Italy, and we literally can uh, bottle a one hundred gallon tank in about an hour. Can you believe that? I mean, he's, he gets ten people working, and they're doing all different kinds of things. It's a, it's like. I, I picture a bunch of firemen passing those those uh, you know buckets of water, Absolutely. but uh, these are buckets of wine, baby. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and look, he's got uh, man. Look, check this out. I mean, big. See, marketing is important, guys, and and good marketing. Look, clean, a lot of white space, right? Cool little images. I mean, think website. That would be a good website, wouldn't it? Not just you know filled up with too much stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I like your stuff, man. I like I appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. First time I came here, there was nothing. Okay, it was nothing. Oh yeah, it was wide open. The first game, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing here. And now, how many? How many of uh, uh, you started? Uh, I guess the first idea was selling to ski resorts, and, right, yeah. but then that uh, that led you to other ideas, right? Now you have distribution yeah. all over. The place, yeah, actually. absolutely. Yeah. So we are in about 300 locations throughout Colorado right now. Um, it's pretty cool. <sighs> Man, how nice. Oh. Yeah. Now, tell me about that little machine over there. I'm just going to walk over to it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Check this out. Every time I come here, you've got new toys, all right? Yeah, yeah. so this is our, so this is a, uh, this is a canner. Um, Step yeah, over here. Get out of the sun there. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Let's see, we got, so that's a problem. We live in a, we live in a state with 300 days of shine. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so this is our, our canning line. Um, we can do about 15 cans per minute. Um, this will allow us to go national. Um, this actually costs more than my first house. <laughs> Got to Crazy. invest invest in your business. Yeah. Invest in yourself first, right? Read the books, listen to the audios, associate with people. Uh, Matthew was just telling me about how, how he's uh, he loves his Bible uh, group. Yep. Because it's a bunch of uh, businessmen or su and successful people, and uh, again, it's it's kind of like our group, right? Iron sharpens iron, and so they, they become uh, everybody. Everybody becomes better. First time I came here, there was nothing in this in this place, okay? And this wall was closed. I'm not going to go back there because it's just a bunch of you know, it's kind of storage. Yep. But see, what's the name of that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So so that that's our forklift, and we call it Buddy the Elf. <laughs> Because elf stands for entry level forklift. So that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How cool is that? He got the forklift for free, you know, yeah. just 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 to if, if he wanted to expand to that extra space and 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 he needed the room anyway, so he played played hard to get and got himself a forklift. I mean, how sweet is that? Anyway, well, hey, I am so happy. I am so proud uh, that number one that you're my friend yeah. and that you're making it happen. You're an inspiration, man. Yeah, thank I can't, you. I can't wait to taste that stuff. All right, guys. Take care. We'll see you tonight at the uh, at, at the uh, Zoom call, okay? The meet and greet. Take care. Bye-bye. There's always so many exciting things to hear about, some fun facts about themselves. It never ceases to amaze me. Some of the is just, I think they're talked about. And I think that that's another reason why I think this is so important, what you're doing in your work. You have such an incredible story yourself with having been to the Olympics four times. I think more people really need to hear your story. Now more than ever, it will uplift, encourage, well, and empower people to, oh, you know, in the face of what seems. Amen. Yeah. You, yeah. 
Um, I'm it a, is possible. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, people need it. And um, corporate is not, they're still holding on to, to, to their, their money. Uh, they're not, you know, they're just playing it safe. But schools and government, they're still spending money. So now I figured, and I spoke for some kids last week and uh, I have so much fun talking to little kids because they ask the best questions. And um, it's that coupled with somebody telling me about the market changes, I thought, hey, let's just start calling schools again. I mean, even if I, even if I make 1500 bucks a gig, I'm doing it from home. I could do more than one a day and they add up, you know, money still spends. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know what I would love for, because, uh, you know, we're recording this. And so we'll play it for those who aren't able to join us uh, tonight. They'll be able to watch the replay. So why don't you give us a, an overview of your, some people are familiar with your history and there's more that are, that are not familiar than those who are. So why don't you take us a little, give us a little soup to nuts overview, how you came to go to the Olympics, not once, but more than once, which is incredible in and of itself. And what your thought process was and what you felt before you made the decision and as you moved forward, because I think that's so appropriate. It's all about mindset and about your state of being. And right now, the name of the game is those who are succeeding, who are thriving, who are keeping healthy, who are doing well, are the ones who are able to master their minds and, and state control. Yeah, and the ones that, that, that uh, embrace change too, because this is change, you know, it's, basically that's what we're going through, change, okay? And so, we we're talking about this with Matthew uh, over at his winery today. Uh, he calls it pivoting, right? You're pivoting, changing direction. But he, we were both talking about how a lot of industries are getting hit. There's going to be a big shakedown, but we're not going down, right? This is the time to work harder than ever. A lot of people are holding back and saying it's safe. But if you're, if you're running now and trying different things, then you'll start figuring out what works. And when COVID is over, you're gonna be, able, you already have a running start. You're gonna be so far ahead of everybody because they still have to get themselves going. Now, this is an opportunity. I mean, it really is for everybody. Things are changing. We're gonna take advantage of the opportunity. I and mean, we wanna look back 20 years from now and say, this is our finest hour because this is when we really dug deep and made it happen. So successful people just think that way. I mean, it's, it's ingrained in us. Thank you for saying that because it is so, so true. And I want you to say it again about that. That's what successful people do. It's how successful people think. Well, successful people, uh, they, uh, you know, if you're adapting to change, that's not good enough. Because if you're adapting to it, that means uh, you still have a bad attitude about it. <laughs> you know, no, take, take advantage of change, okay? Be, embrace change. I never, I don't know, embrace change always sounded, did, didn't hit the mark for me. And so I went to the thesaurus and I started looking, okay, embrace, okay, let's look at some words. And one of them was to take advantage of. I like that a lot better, you know, let's take advantage of this. It's an opportunity. And so successful people understand that, you know, they see an opportunity, they, you know, they, they, we understand that we always hear it's a window of opportunity. Well, windows open and they close, right? Only you don't know it's going to close. So successful people make quick decisions. A decision that's wrong is better than no decision because a decision that wrong, that's wrong gives you information. Now you're ahead of the competition because you know one more piece of information, right? So either way you win. Just throw. So anyways, so to answer your question, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the super reader's digest uh, version, okay? Because uh, just, just, I think... A lot of these people may have already heard this, but I was born in Argentina. Oh, oh uh, you know what? I didn't, when we did the radio interview on my show, you didn't mention that you were born in Argentina. How, I didn't know that. How long ago did we do that? That radio show? Oh, I don't know. It was, I don't Price, know. 10 years ago? Close? It was pre-2015, I think, maybe. Yeah, it was either okay. 13, 14. Now, did we meet at one of the secret knocks? Are we, um, we have Greg Reed in, in common? I think that's where we met originally, was at secret knock, yeah. Okay, all right. 
so yeah and it's funny i just i had somebody just joined the group or or posted for the first time in his group and his first name is fabian right well fabian in spanish is fabian right fabian and it's a pretty common name you know it's not like john john or bob but there's a lot of fabians in, in argentina especially people in my age group it was popular <laughs> and so i uh i asked him uh, you know, are you from Argentina? Because that's a common name, and he wrote Colombia. And so we just switched to Spanish right away. So when you look at that thread, it just, if you don't speak Spanish, get, get your dictionary, okay? <laughs> We're talking soccer all of a sudden, and it just took like one second. <laughs> but, so I was born in Argentina. Uh, my dad was a chemical engineer with Exxon. We came to the States in 1968 when I was six years old. Queens, New York for a couple of years, then Houston for a couple of years, and Venezuela for a couple of years. Oil brat, right? You move around a lot. And then back to Houston, and been in Houston most of my life. Houston's great. People are so friendly. Great restaurants. But it's hot and humid and sticky and mosquitoes and traffic. I could never stand. You're always going from one AC to another. You hardly ever spend any time outside. And I always wanted to move out here to Colorado. And, we, and on a school trip, I went to Houston Baptist University. And we we came and played Air Force Academy and School of Mines, and uh, we stayed in the mountains. I thought, oh my gosh, no mosquitoes here. It's cool, crisp, beautiful. I won't move here. So that's when I caught that dream, right? Back when I was in college. So one dream leads to another. When I was 10, I saw the Olympics on TV, on TV and, and I was hooked. I knew that's what I want to do. But the problem is I'm not a great athlete. <laughs> I can't run fast. I, I can't jump high. I can't, uh, and I'm not super strong. I'm like your neighbor. I mean, seriously, a lot of heart, nobody, just like Rudy, right? <laughs> and so, but you know what? Let's pause here because every single Olympic athlete, before they became Olympic athletes, they weren't, and they weren't extraordinary yet. But they decided to do something extraordinary, and then they shifted. They pivoted into the direction of greatness and then they became olympic athletes like you so it was a choice it's a choice success is a decision you know sooner or later you you know it's funny i had this mentor a long time ago he's a multi-millionaire and a truck driver okay so he he didn't mince words right he was not the politically correct guy but he said you know what reuben if somebody falls just kick them okay <laughs> if they get up and kick you back that's a winner <laughs> <laughs> so successful people, you know, they make a decision and when things, you know, don't work out, they get mad, right? And then that rouses up the, the champion inside and they, and they get going. Um, they don't shrink and stay down, right? They bounce back up. And so, yeah, um, I saw the Olympics, got all excited. I became an Olympic groupie. I knew everything about the Olympics for, you know, I didn't do anything for 11 years. But during those 11 years, my dad got me reading biographies, and then I got into personal development, and listening to tapes. And uh, when I went, golly, all through college, my car, I was stepping on millionaires all day long because I had cassette tapes all inside my car, right? I mean, I would barely drive because there's so many cassettes because I'm listening and put, putting that stuff in. And so I was growing. I didn't know I was growing, but I was, right? And when I was 21, I'm watching the Olympics on TV, and I see Scott Hamilton win the gold medal, and he's about five foot one, 110 pounds soaking wet. I thought, if that little guy can win, <laughs> I can at least play, okay? I'll be next Olympics no matter what. It's a done deal. I just got to find a sport. And I would played soccer all my life. I'm only good enough to be a bench one. But all of a sudden, you know, I'd always had the desire, but I didn't have the belief, right? I wrote a book called The Courage to Succeed. And it's not my courage to succeed, it's the courage to succeed, right? Everybody's courage is this stuff that's out there. And by the way, <laughs> this is interesting. You only have to be courageous for about 10 seconds, okay? Till you face your fear. And then you're on the other side of the fear and now you got momentum and nine times out of 10, you realize that wasn't bad at all. So you don't have to be courageous forever, just for a few seconds till you take action, right? And so, um, what I, I believe you got to have two types of courage to reach your, whatever your goal is. You got to have the courage to get started, right? Cause it's scary. It's scary, you know, to get started. And I asked three questions for, to everyone that joins 
this group. And you know that we have some really successful people in this group, right? And uh, one of the questions is, you know, what's holding you back or what's your biggest challenge? And uh, what I keep seeing is fear, 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 getting myself to take action. You know, it's overcoming that momentum. That's coming up over and over and over again. And these are, these are successful people. <laughs> I mean, it's so uh, the not, you know, average people, if successful people are, are feeling that, Average people are petrified, right? <laughs> so you, gotta, you have to have the courage to get started and the courage to not quit, right? Courage to get started comes from, you know, believing it's possible, right? If you believe something's possible, I'll give it a shot. Courage to not quit, that comes from your desire. If you want something badly enough, ain't nothing going to make you quit, right? And so um, uh, when you have to stay in the game long enough to learn the skills, everything's hard at the beginning. So you have to stick in, stay in the game long enough to learn the skills and then you use the skills to reach the goal or the dream. And that just takes time. But you have to be in the game first, right? You can't just be watching from the sidelines. And so for the longest time, I had the desire. I didn't have the belief. I see Scott Hamilton. Now I got the belief. I'm ready to take action, right? And I went to the library, I got this big book about the Olympics, I'm looking at all the summer sports, it took me five minutes to realize you gotta be a super athlete to do any of this stuff, no way, right? And I got down, right, kind of, you know, semi-depressed. <laughs> then I'm looking at the list of the winter sports, and my nickname in high school was Bulldog, because I was very tenacious, because reading all these biographies got me to realize that successful people the one thing that I could see over and over and over in every biography I read was perseverance. They just refused to quit, right? They're hard heads, right? Uh -huh. If your mom called you a hard head when you were a little kid, you got what it takes, right? <laughs> Boy, it's so, so, um, so perseverance. My nickname in high school was Bulldog because I was very tenacious. And so now as I'm looking through that list of uh, winter sports, the analytical side of my brain kicked in. And I started thinking, you know, I'm about to put together a plan for the next four years. It probably would make sense to base the plan on my strengths. My strength is not athleticism. I'm a slowpoke. My strength is perseverance. I'm a bulldog. Remember, I'm a world-class bulldog, right? And so I thought, I have to find a sport that's so tough. A sport's got so many broken bones in it, there'd be a lot of quitters, right? <laughs> Only I won't quit. I'll make it to the top on the attrition rate. That's my whole plan. I'm going to outlast these stuff. And so I had it down to ski jump, bobsled, and luge. I lived in Houston, Texas. I never skied before, so forget ski jump. That would have been suicide, right? <laughs> bobsled. I mean, who are you going to find three other nuts in Houston want to do a bobsled? I got to go to Jamaica for that. <laughs> so so um, I'm friends with one of the guys. Okay, He actually makes fun of me in his, in his presentation, so we have to, you know, keep keep it alive. But that left the luge. I'd never seen a luge at that point in my life. If I had, there's no way I would have done it. I'd never seen it on TV. I just had a picture of a little guy in a luge. I thought, that looks really tough. That's one for me. I didn't even know where the track was. So what do you do? My dad always said, you have to find somebody that's done what you want to do, follow in their footsteps, right? That's the, that's the easiest way to succeed at anything. Just find the coach or mentor. And um, uh, he would say, if you have to cross a minefield, it probably makes sense to follow somebody that's already crossed it, right? <laughs> Preferably somebody still walking. <laughs> so somebody has fruit on the trees, not a theorist. Okay, I would rather my mem my uh, I would rather my my mentor be a a high school dropout that's actually done what I want to do. And somebody's got three PhDs, but never did it, right? No. If they have the, if they did it and they have the PhD, that's great. That's even better, right? But I want, I'm after the guy that's been through the minefield. And so, well, nobody in Houston's going to know where this track is. Sports Illustrated is their job, right? So I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter. You know, this is before the internet. Where do you go to learn how to luge? Signed, Ruben. <laughs> yeah. And they actually wrote back. And they said Lake Placid, New York. That's, that's where the track is, right? Let me show you something. This is one reason that I really love a virtual because now I can take people and do show and tell. And see, I, I am a student of success, okay? That's probably a third of the books I've, I've read. Now, they sent me this picture. It's a guy on a luge, all right? Really? And I put it on this frame. 
right, right in front of my bed in my bedroom. First person I saw when I woke up in the morning was the luge man. He reminded me, hey, I'm going for the Olympics. I got to eat right, got to work out, got to hang around winners, read good books, listen to good audios, put good stuff here. At night, before I shut off the lights, last person I saw was the luge man. So what do you think I dreamt about at night? Luge, Olympics. That was my goal setting system. Kept it in front of me, all right? He's in my, he's in my office now. Now that I know better, this guy, his, his feet are not, are not even pointed, okay? And his head's way up. You got three air brakes right there. See all the, how raggedy that suit is? This guy's been in a lot of wrecks. He's a beginner, right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> this guy helped me get to the Olympics. <laughs> because his job, he's the luge man, right? I named the, the, the website after him. Actually, the real reason is the ice man was taken. But, <laughs> but it, his job wasn't to be perfect for me. My coach is gonna show me how to, how to be better. His job was to remind me I'm going for this, right? Make sense? Yeah. So, and, and, and by doing that, by just following this guy, hang on. a few years later, I became that guy, right? Feet are pointed, head's a little bit high, okay, could be better, but hey, got to, got to play with the big boys, right? <laughs> Not perfect. You right? You, you you don't go. You don't. You can't be a perfectionist. Uh, you can you can try for perfection, but just try to be better. Just try to be better than the than the last day, right? And so Lake Placid. No, I, I call Lake Placid. I told I told him I'm an athlete here in Houston. I want to learn how to lose. So I'm in the Olympics for four years. Will you help me? And the guy goes, "How old are you?" I said, "21." He starts laughing. He says, "No way, man. You should have ten years experience at your age." We start him off when they're eight, nine, 10 years old. There's no, he's trying to talk me out of it. I knew hanging up's not an option. If I hang up, the phone's all over. So hanging up, so I just tried to make friends with him, right? Create some rapport. Meanwhile, in my head, I'm thinking there's always a way, there's always a way, there's always a way. If I don't quit, I'll find that way because God always gives you a way. I got that going in my head, right? My mentors taught me that, right? When life knocks you down, winners can't, don't have the luxury to stay down and whine and complain and no. No, winners have to bounce right back up, right? Uh, like a boxer. I have a couple of boxer friends, and they always say, hey, when, when you get knocked down boxing, you got 10 seconds, okay? You get up, and in under 10 seconds, you're still in the fight. But if you wait 11 seconds, you lost the fight. So from today on, if you're listening to this, uh, you're an honorary boxer, okay? Because we're winners, right? Life knocks you down, you bounce back up, and you still got momentum. If you stay down there, you're toast, right? You lose all. You have to work ten times harder to, to get there. So, so, I went to Lake Placid. Finally, the guy agreed, and I'm glad that he he didn't candy coat it. He was actually trying to talk me out of it, right? He said, "If you want to do it at your age, you want to do it in just four years, it's brutal. Nine out of ten people quit." I thought, wow, this works right into my plan. This is perfect. <laughs> and so what's the second thing? Because I'm going to tell you two things. Uh, expect to break some bones. And I said, great, you know. And he got real quiet and finally comes back. Goes, what's wrong with you, man? I told you you're going to break some bones. That makes you happy. I told him, man, I hope it's 10 times harder what you're telling me. I hope it's 100 times harder. Harder it is, easier it is for me. Because I'm not a quitter. I'm bulldog, okay? I was praying that the Germans would quit, okay? Because they dominate the sport. <laughs> I didn't pray hard enough. They show up, they race, they get their medals. They're gonna get excited. I mean, they win so many medals. They got a problem now. Where am I gonna stick this one? <laughs> so, so I went and I'm glad he, he told me it would be tough because that allowed me to put on mental armor, right? I knew this is gonna be tough. This is gonna be warfare, okay? I don't break bones, okay? So how am I gonna handle it? What am I going to do if I break a bone? Well, I've broken bones before. You know, you wear a cast for six weeks, 40 days. It's, it's healed, and it's actually stronger than before. So when you really think about it, a broken bone's a temporary inconvenience. <laughs> so what am I going to do? I'll just come back. So I had a contingency plan, right? You, you prepare for the worst, right? But you hope for the best, right? But you prepare for the worst. Otherwise, you know knock you on your on your rear end right some of these other guys i was with they were quitting because they had bruises i mean it's ridiculous right <laughs> maybe they didn't have the desire right maybe they you know, thought it was going to be a cakewalk i mean it's true maybe they like the idea of being an olympian but not the uh, the reality right 
So they all started quitting, you know, and I, I just stuck it out. And the first two years was brutal. I broke my foot twice, my knee, my elbow, my hand, my thumb, a couple of ribs. My neck was hurting all the time because your head's pulling six Gs on some of those curves. But, hey, that's just, you know, I just focus on the dream, right? You focus on the You don't focus, you know, you, winners focus on the dream. They don't focus on the obstacles. There's always going to be obstacles. But you focus on the dream because the dream gives you strength and power and everything you need to bust through those obstacles, right? Average people. And, and what you focus on gets bigger in your life. If all you focus on is how dangerous it is or, or how much it hurts, that's, that's all you're going to be thinking of. That's going to knock you out. You focus on the dream. Fo successful people focus on what they want. Average people focus on what they don't want. I have a friend that's a race car driver. I mean, <laughs> like Formula, Formula One, okay? And he was telling me that when you race rally, rally racing, you know, and, uh, on dirt roads in the back country, um, they teach you that uh, if, you're gonna, if you're losing control, you're, gonna, you're coming off a curve or something, you're just going to get coming off. It says, don't look at the light pole. Because if you hit that, see that light, look at the light pole, if you fixate on that, it, you're going to hit it. You look at the hole in between the light poles and you'll be safe, right? So you don't look at the bad thing, look at the good thing, that's space, right? It's the same, same concept. And so anyways, so if they compressed 10 years of luge into two years so I could compete and try to qualify the last two. And I broke into the top 50 by skin on my teeth and I uh, got to go to the Calgary Olympics, 88. And then I competed four more years and did Albertville, 1992. And then I quit, I quit, I was done. I want to try different things. And um, I quit for about seven years. And then my coach starts calling me back. He goes, Ruben, you must come back. Lose knees, Argentina. <laughs> and I said, forget it, coach. It's, uh, I'm done, man. I'm doing other things. And I hung up on him. It felt so good because he's you know, hanging up on coach. Because he's, he's a tough guy. <laughs> he's mean and tough. His standards are so high. This guy was three-time world champion. Well, he's a winner. He wouldn't take no for an answer. He calls back. Ruben, you know. U.S. Olympic spirit, Salt Lake City Olympics would be the best. You don't want to miss it. you regret it if you don't go, well, thanks, but no thanks, coach. Bye. Click. Oh, that time it hurts. I don't want to miss anything. I don't regret anything. And he calls back. He goes, I got a deal for you. <laughs> he totally lost his accent. <laughs> he goes, I got a deal for you. I got a camp in Calgary. You get yourself to Calgary, and I'll take care of room, board, uh, track fees, Every time we take a luge run, it's 40 bucks. We take five or six a, a, a day, okay? It's expensive. And um, take care of everything for two weeks. After two weeks, you let me know if you want in or out. Now, Coach is not only the toughest guy I know, he's also the, the cheapest guy I know. <laughs> he never, ever bought me a beer or a, even a nice tea. And now he's offering me thousands of dollars of free training. I thought, man, they must really want me. And so on the spot, because see, the way it works, I see you're looking confused because I didn't explain it right. That's why it's not your fault. It's my fault. It's a communication, right? If there's a miscommunication, whose fault is it? It's the person that's talking, right? It's true. So when I first called Lake Placid, the guy wouldn't let me in, right? He's giving me all these excuses. And I'm trying to make friends with him. And I happened to tell him that I was born in Argentina. And it was just like, you did, right? Oh, I know you're from Argentina. Well, he did. You're from Argentina? He goes, yeah. Well, if you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you. I said, why? You weren't going to help me before. And he says, well, the sport of luge is this close from getting kicked out of the Olympics because we're not global enough. Oh. Right? The Olympics, you got you to have sports that have people from all over the world, right? We, well, we have a few, U.S., Canada, a handful of European countries, that's it. You know, we don't even have anybody in South America. I mean, if you if you made it, you'd be a, you know you'd be a whole continent. Oh, I'm a continent now, huh? Hmm. <laughs> so that's why they were willing to help, right? Because they had for the last twenty years, the U.S. had been investing millions of dollars on on their athletes to try to develop them. And but if it's not an Olympic sport anymore, it's money down the drain. And so they realized we have to develop some other guys. They didn't want me going for the U.S. So I just fell into a win-win. So, wow. so they helped me out big time. The first four years, I was under the U.S. umbrella. And then I went with this uh, uh, Austrian coach. And uh, I've had different coaches over the years. But anyways, so that's why he's calling me back. Luch needs Argentina because we're short on countries again. Well, so I told him, okay, I got a deal for you, coach. I got a brother. He's seen me go to the Olympics twice. And I've seen the look in his eyes. If that deal goes for him too, I'll go. 
right? We got five years. Maybe he can learn the sport. Maybe he can crack into the top 50, right? Maybe he can make it. Well, how old is he? He's 30 years old. 30 years old? Are you crazy? I mean, coach started when he was five, right? I said, oh, you got to see this guy, coach. He's an incredible athlete, you know? He's not. He's an architect, okay? <laughs> but mentally tough, okay? He's a bulldog, too. We don't have any chihuahuas in our, in our, in our house. <laughs> and so he's tough. So I knew he could do it. I was, all right, bring him along. Click, hangs up on me, right? So I go to my brother, Marcelo. And I tell him, look, worst case scenario, he didn't even know I was negotiating for him because it was just on the fly, right? And uh, I said, look, worst case scenario, you got a two, two week free vacation in, in Canada. He says, yeah, I could die on this vacation. Yours, right, Ruben? He goes, yeah. But best case scenario, you know, you could be an Olympian. Think about it. You could be the Olympic architect, right? <laughs> and he says, you know what? I'll do it. And, and, and then he tried it. He actually liked it. And he's better suited for it because I'm wound way too tight for the sport. You have to be very, very calm and relaxed on the sled. And me, I'm like, I'm riding a Bronco Buster. And so he was actually, he actually liked it. And he said, you know what? Architecture is so broad, but this is so focused. It just brings up. Uh, Hey, it's like it brings balance to my life. I say, okay, whatever, man, yin, yang, and blue. But he went, and <laughs> he broke a few bones. He kept coming back. And um, on the last race before the Olympics, he got a bunch of World Cup points. Didn't look like he was going to make it, but he cracked into the top 50, and we made Olympic history. First time two brothers compete against each other in the loop. His story's better than mine, right? Wow. But we took that decision. Remember we said, success decision, right? We decided it. He started eating right, started working out like a fiend. He got ripped, okay? It was like those before and after pictures you see in the magazines, but this was true. <laughs> no Photoshop. And, you know, he, he paid the price and he made it, you know? He's, and now he's the Olympic architect. And so, uh, if, a, I mean, if you're listening to this, guys, just think about it. If a 30-year-old out-of-shape architect can make it to the Olympics, imagine what you can do, Right. I mean, we're not super athletes. We're just, we're just strong inside. I mean, that's it. You know, heart. You got to have heart. And so I, so I did uh, uh, Calgary 88, Alberville 92, Salt Lake City 2002. And then I quit again, right? I started building my business, my speaking business, wrote books. And, you know, that, that kept me busy for about six years. And then I got bored again. I started training and I made Vancouver at 47 i was 40 47 yeah everybody thought i was a coach <laughs> and uh, my claim to fame i'm the first guy to ever compete in four winter olympics in four different decades right 80s 90s 2020 2010. and so uh, again you know i love inspirational movies you know rudy rocky uh, miracle i just love them you know the rookie uh, there's so many of them like that and i love them because they give me hope right? You know, they, they remind you that the underdog can win, right? If those guys can win, maybe I can too, right? That's why I like reading biographies. And my favorite ones are the ones that are just like that, you know, the Helen Kellers, uh, the, um, you know, the Mother Teresa's, you know, people that, that, you know, had everything going against them and they made something incredible happen, right? And they fire me up. They give me hope. Oh, whenever I have a, and everybody does, okay? When everybody, whenever I have a bad day, I get into my little pity party, invariably, I'll see somebody in a wheelchair. It's like, okay, thank you, God. I got, I got the message, right? <laughs> um, uh, I, I should be grateful instead of whining. It's true. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the not-so-quick story. <laughs> That is extraordinary. You said so many things that I want to bring back to the viewers here, because one of the, the key things that you said was that, you know, to make a decision, it's like, okay, it's okay to make a decision and make a mistake, but at least you're still moving. And as long as you're making decisions and making mistakes, you get momentum and you're moving forward, but you no. said something key about making decisions and it's okay to make a mistake because at least you have momentum moving forward that's all right yeah and and you make a mis you make a decision and at least you're not stuck and stagnant you make a decision th th i don't even think they're those things that you think are mistakes when you keep moving forward and look back hindsight is 2020 and you realize you know what i thought this was a mistake and 
that was a mistake, but obviously I succeeded. So you zigzagged your way and with that momentum, you got to, to your goal as opposed to being yeah. stuck in indecision. Exactly. Yeah. Um, indecision is almost like you're in quicksand, right? Bloop, 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 you're dead. <laughs> you know, you're, um, you know, you, if you have momentum and you fall, at least you're falling forward, right? You're, you're a couple of feet closer <laughs> and you get yourself up and you start running again. And so, yeah. And you learn, you learn, you know, my, when COVID uh, hit mid March, started getting a ton of cancellations. Everybody was canceling their meetings, right? After about two days, I, I told my wife to stop spending stuff because we got nothing coming in. And I was deer in the headlights for about three days. And then I realized, okay, let's just figure this one out. So I called a couple of buddies or speakers too. And we said, you know, let's figure this out. Let's throw mud on the wall. Some of it's going to stick. We'll clean up the mess later, right? And so let's try everything. Let's make every mistake we can possibly make in the next few weeks. And we'll get together on Zoom two or three times a, a week to share best practices and figure out what works. You know, if we make three, we got three people, we have the opportunity to make three times as many mistakes, right? And if we focus on doing as many different things as we can, then we'll, you know, hopefully we'll figure out the 20% of the stuff that actually does work. And then we just stop doing the 80 and, and we did, and we figured it out. And, and since then, um, you know, I'm growing the, the virtual side of the business and, and that's not going to go away. And it's awesome because in our group here, we have, uh, uh, have some friends from India. And, uh, we're starting to open up doors over there. So we're going to do some showcases uh, with some, some people that could possibly book me to speak. And, uh, you know, we'll do a Zoom call with 20, 30, 50, 100 uh, decision makers and tell them my story. You think I'm going to get some gigs? And then our, nobody has to worry about flights and because we're just going to do it this way, right? And uh, doing the same thing, I have a friend in our group as well from Poland, right? I spoke in Poland five years ago this week when we became friends. And we were just on a Zoom call yesterday. He says, yeah, I mean, I'm going to, you know, well, we're just partnering up with him. I says, look, for Zoom calls, I need to make a minimum, okay? But beyond that minimum, you know, we'll split it 50-50 because I got no costs in it, right? I can do three of these a day, five of them a day, no problem. You can't do that with 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 speaking live, I'm just seeing the opportunity and I'm pumped up. I, I think this is going to be awesome. <laughs> I really am. And I'm not saying it to be Mr. Positive. I'm just saying it because I believe it. I mean, this is, you know, this is going to be good. You hit the nail right on the head. And one of the things people keep on saying, which is true, our entire planet, the globe, has never seen a pandemic of this proportion where we have a global pandemic and it's really a global reset where the entire globe is going through this shared experience. But one thing we have all experienced, in the United States, we all went through the mortgage crisis of 2008. We went through that foreclosure market. We went through that housing uh, crisis in the early 90s again. You know, So we've had multiple foreclosure markets in the last 50 years. So that's not new. We've had different parts of the world has experienced war, a time of being in war, and then you're, you're done, you put the war behind you, you know, the Vietnam War, Afghanistan War, you have Desert Storm, et cetera. And then you have the aftermath. So in every single instance, those were experiences that we had never experienced before. I remember during the 2008 mortgage crisis, I had a mortgage bank. And so I had a lot of loan officers and mortgage executives working for me. And I was a producer as well as the owner of the company and founder. And I also had a real estate, international real estate brokerage. And so I had brokers and agents that were working for me. And I noticed that the difference between the agents who embraced the mortgage meltdown, embraced the foreclosure market. Some of them, it's their first foreclosure market. For, for many of them, it was the second or third foreclosure market that they were experiencing. And those who didn't wait for things to go back to normal or wait for things to, to change to, to the real estate boom, those were the ones who succeeded because despite, that's not to say that it wasn't challenging. It was scary. It was challenging. It was difficult. There was, we were on literally for both the real estate and the lending industry, we were on underwriting quicksand. So it didn't matter, you know, you could have a ton of transactions put together in the past, every single one of them. But they wouldn't. Yeah. And in the new market, all you would have out of 10 transactions, maybe two would close. So you, oh, wow. you couldn't count on a hundred percent of your production closing because now, you know, a 
what 70% of them or 80% of them were short sales. And with the guidelines, literally things on Monday, you would underwrite to these guidelines. And by Wednesday, you would get something that said anything that doesn't close by 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. We don't care if you've got all the conditions. It doesn't matter if it's not funded by tomorrow at 11. These are the new guidelines. So, wow. And then wow. trying to get approved. So you had a moving target. So we had a moving target. Sometimes that would happen twice when you only have five business work days. We may be working seven days a week, but you only funded Monday through Friday because, you know, you're tied to the mortgage backed securities and the stock exchange market, in New York. So it was only Monday through Friday that we could fund and record. And so if you, you know, two days, that's 40%, you know, two, four, six, eight, ten, a hundred percent of your production, your funding production closings were contingent upon closing between Monday and Friday. So if you have the day for Monday and Tuesday, you have these underwriting guidelines that are, you know, in place, that's 40% of your work week. Now, 60% of your work week, hopefully you don't have another change. Can you imagine when we had two changes in a week? No. <laughs> Oh my wow. gosh, we've been in underwriting for three weeks, for six weeks, for two months. It's taken us- And they pulled months. the rug from under you. Yeah. yeah. Months to get this closed. We're fun, you know, juggling all the plates, trying to get buyers, sellers, everybody on the same page of music. Keep, you know, everybody has fears. You know, the seller really wants it to sell because they don't want a foreclosure on their, on their, um, sure. on their record. The buyer, they've been competing against every, everybody in their, brother you know to get this house finally they got this house and now they want to be able to move into this house and successfully complete a transaction and now we're like oh well yeah you were approved but we need these are the wow. new requirements it's almost like going wow. back to so it was very precarious but you know what you had to keep as the like if i'm freaking out as the broker owner then of course my agents are going to be freaking out too. And the same thing in the, in the mortgage bank. So you had to have that mental resolve and say, you know what? It doesn't matter. You just got to keep going. You got to keep the troops calm and keep them focused and say, you know what? You just got to keep moving forward and you can't hang everything on any one transaction. You got to take care of everybody, right? but you got right. to Keep moving forward. You got to keep putting stuff in the pipeline because a hundred percent is not sure. So sure. you have and to years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's doubling, yeah. tripling. No, back when I was in college, I read the art of the deal back when, well, when it came out right in the early eighties or mid eighties. And my favorite part of that book is the first part day of the life and then, or, or week in the life. And then the last part, the last chapter. So he goes through all the deals that he's working on. Right. And during this week, and it's tons of them. Right. Yeah. And then the middle of the book is this whole story. Great. But the last chapter is how they turned out and only a few of them actually made it, but it made me realize you have to have a bunch of, be juggling a ton of balls in the air because only a few of them, you know, you're going to drop a bunch of them. <laughs> don't, don't do a lot of people will focus on one and wait, 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 wait. Oh, it didn't close. And then you have to recover from that and then start another one. Wait, wait, no, no, you work on, like you were saying, a bunch of them because just two out of 10 are going to close. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny that you mentioned that book because I read that book when I was in high school and I will never forget that one of my big takeaways, I remember him saying that he got people like on a napkin, he'll be at a business lunch. And if they didn't have paper on a napkin, he would sign, you know, whatever, and have both of them sign of it. That's a legal contract, that napkin. Huh. And so I thought that I will never forget. Number two, yeah. that it didn't matter what you had in writing. It didn't matter if it was a mortgage note. It didn't matter if it was a sales agreement. It didn't matter what kind of agreement or contract you had. As long as you found the decision maker that was willing to agree to something new, you could pretty much override anything that was in there before. That's huh, huh. why I was able to, to serve, not only survive, I was able to thrive, made a ton of money during the whole meltdown of the recession in the early 90s, where all of a sudden all the mortgages, like regular refinances and purchases pretty much dried up. Fast forward to then 2006, seven and eight, when we had the mortgage meltdown. Well, that was not my first foreclosure market. And I remember 
It didn't matter what was in the original mortgage note, whatever the prepayment penalties were. It didn't matter. As long as I could get to the key decision maker in whatever bank, whoever owned the note, once I could get their verbal agreement, then, I, then it was a matter of getting their signature done. It didn't matter. So I would get them to forgive. That was sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. That sure, sure. difference on whether the deal was going to be made or not made. And so my competitors, they're assuming, oh, it says- They didn't know that. In the note. It's so over. That's it. Part of our expense is, oh, we can't do this deal. Whereas with me, it's like, I just know I need to wiggle my way up. And of course, the challenge, it was easier in the 90s as opposed to- in 2006, seven and eight, you have more doorkeepers and more, um, it's harder to get to the CEO or to the chairman of the board. And because ultimately that's what you have to do. And to get them to say, not only will they take your call, reason with them in two or three minutes. And then after that, it's just following up because they already agreed to it and they're not flakes. And then you get the written signature. And so, if I hadn't read that, you book, you made a you made a really good point. The CEO or the chairman of the board has the power to say yes. Sure. Everybody else just has the power to say no. That's why you deal with the person at the top. Yeah. Well, and as a CEO, anybody can say no. Yeah, and and the other thing is, as a CEO and chairman of the board, you're accountable to your stockholders. If you keep on getting bad mortgage debt that goes on your books, as opposed to selling something with a short sale that still brings profit into the corporation, that's a better deal for you. Now, the people between the CEO and the person who answers the phone, they don't care about that. They're just, they have these guidelines and they're hired to do a- Yeah, they're just watching their rear end. That's all they're they're doing. Like you said, they have the authority to say no. However, the chairman of the board and the CEO, they have a greater accountability. It's not just about running the organization. Yeah, but they're part of their employer is really all the stockholders that they're accountable to and the bottom line. And so understanding that you have to understand, okay, what's in it for him. It's like, he's not just going to forgive. Them right, them. right, right. Right. Obviously. Yeah. The benefit to yeah. you is you, cl- you now, instead of having that bad mortgage debt a hundred percent because the deal didn't close because the numbers didn't work. Listen, all you have to do is forgive six months of prepayment penalty. Now we got a doable deal. We already have everything is done. We just need your signature so we can fund. That's an easy yes for him. And the benefit is he's got money coming into his organization because he's being paid sure. off. No, it makes sense. The same thing is in, in the speaking industry. I, I do a lot of sales kickoffs because my background was in copier sales. And I've probably, I've, I've spoken for tons of Fortune 500 companies and it's usually for their salespeople. When I, if I'm speaking as a, as a speaker, you know, you don't want to negotiate with a meeting planner. The meeting planner make, make sure that everything's working when the lights are there, the audio, everything. You want to talk to the VP of sales, right? Because it's his bottom line. If his people get fired up, they can pay off my my fee in just a couple of weeks, right? Because, you know, they're excited now. They believe they're willing to face their fears. It works, but it's the same thing. You have to try to get to the person at the top, link to them, how it will benefit them. It's funny. I spoke for about a month ago, I guess, maybe six weeks ago. I spoke, for me, but it was Long Island. And it was all all the teachers and it was all the administrators, about 700 people and virtually, right? Afterwards, the superintendent was just sent me a glowing letter. I mean, it was so good. Uh, and so I, I emailed him back and I said, you know what? I've had the headline on my homepage. Uh, I've had it for years, but I've never really liked it. I don't think it really encapsulates what I do for people. And since you're so fired up, would you just, you know, don't answer me right now. I want you to think about, you know, a couple of days, but I want to know what I did for your people that you're so excited, right? What's bottom line? What did I do for your, for your people? And he came back and he said, you inspired them to see the opportunities in their challenges. That's what you do. They see the light now. And I thought, that's what, that's what I do. That's much closer than the old headline. Poof. That's what I got now. So, so, you know, helping people see the opportunity, right? And, um, cause it's an attitude thing. Um, your, your attitude, you know, if you have a bad attitude, you'll never be to perform at the same level. Right, uh, somebody's got a positive a- attitude, is willing to take chances and, and go for it. Right, so, so that's what we're trying to instill to people, and, uh, <laughs> and I think it's working. Did you see that that Russian kid? Was that cool or what? The the kid yes, that's studying I, aviation. 
incredible after he read your book and then he actually went to aviation school he did it what an, an incredible yeah. i wish do you have that on your computer maybe that can... picture man that kid oh my gosh he looks like a movie star yeah. i mean um share screen it oh I, I, I'm doing this on my phone. I live out in the country, and, I, oh, and my okay. phone service is a lot stronger than my my That's my internet service. So I don't use, and and I like it because I'm able to move around and do show and tell. But um, yeah. I get I get e emails like that probably three or four times a year, and it's funny. It's um, he didn't mention it, but most of them will say, "I heard you speak two years ago." It's like it's, there's always a two year gestation period from when they get fired up to like hit a, this major dream and I lost 50 pounds or I paid off my credit cards or whatever. Right. And so this kid, you know, he read the book, he got all pumped up and uh, he pursued his flying dream. And he said this cool, cool picture. He's uh, in uh, civil aviation school and in, in Russia. And I so saw that that was a great, that made my day. So sharp. I'm sure <laughs> I can pull it up here on Facebook to show it because it he looks so sharp in his in his uniform and he's a really young guy very young, oh my god really young. yeah guy. yeah yeah he's probably he's yeah 20 something maybe yeah. so that pumps me up you know because um i'll get those letters and that really man, that keeps you going right and it's like we were talking about i think we were talking about it on on a call uh with someone else in our group i always tell people you got to find somebody that's done what you want to do. And they, then they always come back with, well, well I don't want to impose. Those people are so busy. And I explained to them that, look, you know how you hear that, uh, oh, so-and-so is successful. Yeah, she's successful, but she's not happy. Or he's successful, but he's always looking for something else. He's, you know, he's not happy either. And, and I tell them, you know why that's so? It's because success is not the gold medal. Success is the silver medal right? Uh, the gold medal is called significance. That means you made a difference, right? If your attitude or if your intention is, I want to go to this mentor so they'll show me the ropes. And my intention is I'm going to do whatever they say. I'm going to work my tail off and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make it happen, right? I'm not going to be an eternal learner. I'm going to be an action person. If that's you, then approach them because they'll help you get that silver medal and you help them get the gold medal you help them create that ripple effect of success right and that makes you realize that oh my god that 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 feeling that you made a difference fills that little hole that was that needed to be filled when you just had success right so it's a symbiosis yeah and you know what what people don't realize and this is something that i through my studies in the last uh, couple of years i've become certified in different clinical neurosomatic processes and technologies and one of the things that I realized, it's like, oh my goodness, when you get a mentor, and it doesn't matter if you're face-to-face -face in person or if you're on a Zoom call like this or you're across the world from them, not only are they appealing to your, your mindset, your, your, cause you're, you're getting an insider's view of the self-mastery that they had to embody in order for them to succeed. But another thing that's happening at a biophysical level is that you are in training to their autonomic nervous system. So now you're dealing with a peak performance individual who has, in your case, you've been in four different Olympics and successfully competed. So by them, people training with you, people who are being coached by you, people who are being influenced by you, people who are reading your books and then following you on Facebook and on YouTube, they are in training to your autonomic nervous system along with the, the, the peer group community that you have formed. So I add myself now to that group of people. We are all in training with your autonomic nervous system. It'll be easier for me to tune in, tap in and turn on to my self mastery and get my body into state control so that I can take yeah. successful action. And that's yeah. where that power, uh, it's not just an airy fairy. No, there's a whole lot more that's going on under the surface and inside of you that you're completely unaware of. And I thought, wow, more people. No, that makes sense. Because you can have two people tell you the same thing, but one of them you trust, and that one's actually done it, and the other one's talking from theory, and so one of them will not be effective, right? I have a coach, his name's Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards. He can get in my head. He, he knows how to, he knows the psychology of, of 
being a coach, not just being a, a luge coach. He understands, no, it's the, you got to get in the person's head. He was fourth place in the Little Hammer Olympics, so he's got fruit on the trees too. I mean, he's a top slider. And whatever he says, I mean, I don't care what he says, I, I trust him 100%. I will just do it, right? The, I don't even have a distrusting thought in my mind when he's talking to me. And, uh, and there's another friend that the, one of my boxer friends is that way too. He, he, and those two guys, I wouldn't have made it to the Vancouver Olympics without their help. Uh, and because they were able to get into my head in a way that other coaches couldn't do it. I did the luge for, oh gosh, at that point it was about 25 years and I was still scared. Right. And I was tight. I mean, I, I didn't even like the luge. The, the, the luge was the vehicle. The Olympics was the dream, right? I focused on the dream. And when I got started training for the Vancouver Olympics, Jonathan, he said, I can't believe you're still scared after all these years, man. What's going on in your head when, <laughs> when you're sliding? <laughs> and I say, man, as I see those walls going faster and faster, I get tighter and tighter. And by the bottom half of the track, I can't believe I can even steer because I'm so tight. Wow. And he said, luge is not even about speed. And I said, what? He says, luge is not about speed. You could be clocked at the fastest speed, but if you crash at the bottom, you lost the race. Luge is about who has the best time, okay? In fact, time is so important in the luge, it's the only sport in winter or summer Olympics that's times in one one thousand of a second, okay? We're surrounded in a, uh, by an environment of speed, but it's about the time. And so what you need to do is you need to put on blinders. You need to not look at those walls, okay? You need to be focusing on a spot 30 feet in front of you, and your mindset needs to be, what do I need to do on every section of every curve, you know, steering-wise, to ensure that I'm going to have the best time? Okay, if you do that, then the fear will disappear if you change your focus. And I trust them. That night I did about a hundred mind runs, uh, visualization runs, right? With blinders on like a horse. The next day I go to the track, I take a run, the fear disappeared. It didn't reduce in intensity, it just disappeared. It was like a different sport. And my time started getting faster because I was more relaxed and I was focusing what I needed to do. And so I tell people, you know, <laughs> uh, but to today, I'm, de I'm really telling this story. I tell them, what are you focusing on, right? Are you focusing on the economy? Are you focusing on COVID? Are you focusing on the bad news? You need to stop reading the news, stop watching the news at night, right? Because they are, you know, they make money by, you know, good news doesn't help ratings. Bad news helps ratings. And if they can scare you or make you mad, oh, the ratings skyrocket, okay? And so uh, you, you listen to them. You know, you're not going to want to do anything. You'll be too scared. You know, uh, stop doing that. Read some of these good books. You know, listen to some good audios. But don't look at that stuff. And fo your focus, my focus was what do I need to do, right, in each part of the curve. Your focus is what do I need to do in the next 15 minutes to move my business forward. And you keep all day long. What do I need to do in the next 15 minutes, right? The one thing, okay, just like Curly used to say. What's the one thing you need to do, right? And if you do that, then you'll get through this and you'll be, you'll pass a bunch of people that were your competitors and they'll never catch you because you'll be, you know, one investment you might want to do is uh, buy USA Today subscriptions to all your competitors, <laughs> but don't take the news. <laughs> right? But it's the same thing. Yeah, uh, shifting the focus changes the whole experience. It's, isn't that amazing? You, you said it so eloquently, like when you were talking about your overview of when you did the Olympics and how your friend who was the um, race car driver and how he said, don't look at the light because, you know, you'll, you'll crash. Look at the between the two poles. And you said, yeah, the light like, pole. Don't look at the pole. <laughs> Don't look at the pole because if you're if you're if you're starting to veer right, you're losing control of your car. If you look at the pole, your car is going to go into the pole and, and it's going to be over. You yeah, have to look it just goes there. And that brought me to a memory I had when I was kids, and my oldest son I didn't get to teach him how to ride a bike because my father-in-law did that. But with my daughter, I did get to teach her how to ride a bike, and it taught me it taught her how to ride a bike. But it taught me so much about life and success just teaching her to ride a bike because I noticed that as long as I held, as, okay, I would tell her, okay, we're in the middle of the street. We were, you know, I, there were cars parked on the red, right, parked cars parked on the left, cars parked on the right, and then you have this wide street. 
And I said, okay, we're just going to go straight all the way down the street to the very, very end, which ended at the very end, ended up in a cul-de-sac. As we were practicing, she was doing good. And then I would let go and she would ride for a little bit. And then as she would look to the right, to the parked cars, her bike would start to go towards the parked cars. <laughs> of course, really? Oh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, she was going to crash into the cars. And so needless to say, she would freak out then. I'm like, uh-uh-uh, I would catch her. And I'm like, okay, don't look at the parked cars on the right or to your left. Just look at the end of the street. And as long as you keep your eyes focused on the end of the street, you will end up at the end of the street. So sure enough, we would practice and practice. And she would do fine until she would, you know, maybe a car would come. And then she would notice something catches her eye. Car. Yeah, it was a distraction. A car would come. I go, you're yeah. safe. You're on the right side. They're on the opposite side. And but then she would notice the parked cars on the left. So she would keep looking at the cars parked on the left. And guess what? Her bike would go. Bam. To crash into the, <laughs> into the parked cars. I said, Christelle, you just have to keep looking straight ahead. Notice the car that's coming on the other side. Your peripheral vision is aware that those cars are there, but you don't need to give your undivided attention and focus to that. Because as you see, your bike is going to go where your attention goes. <laughs> Just and your life you. goes too. <laughs> so to me, that was speaking volumes to me as I'm having these realizations as I'm teaching her. And I thought, oh, oh yeah, gosh, I you can't pay attention to what you don't want. You have to focus on what you do want. And you are going to go. That's if great. You're, if you're afraid... <laughs> or you're worried that you're gonna catch a cold, get sick, get the flu, whatever. If you're afraid you're gonna die young, guess what? That's exactly where you're gonna go. If you are happy, grateful, in appreciation that you have good health and your health is getting better, even if you have a cold right now, you know what? That cold- Oh, your antibodies will go up. Yep. Yeah, that cold yeah. is the manifestation of past thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So in this moment, you could have a fever of 104 and you could say, you know what? That was, that's now and yesterday, but now in this next second, my new now is I'm- Yeah, healthy. I'm working on- I'm healthy, <laughs> I'm getting better. The future health. My, my, my temperature is back to normal. My body is being optimized again. I am healthy, wealthy. I am feeling fine <laughs> and fantastic every minute in every way. And you just start focusing on, you know what? There's only a few cells in your body that are creating that illness. You have 50 trillion cells. So you don't even have a billion cells that are influenced, that are giving you that headache, that are giving you that fever, that are giving you whatever inflammation, that's giving you whatever illness. 50 trillion cells. So you're mostly healthy. Yeah. So focus on, let's say. I'm 99% healthy yeah. and 1%. Percent. <laughs> right. Trillion cells, but just for argument's sake, let's say it's 1 trillion cells that are ill with whatever germ, virus, bacteria, whatever illness you might have. 49 trillion are healthy. So you know what? Thanks for the 49 million. That one, it's just a matter of time. If I embrace the 49 million that are healthy, that 1 trillion is going to automatically entrain to the 49 million in a day or two or three you could have an instant remission where in less than 24 hours, you could be completely healthy. Right. That's how people right. instantly get cured of cancer, of all sorts of different things, neurological conditions, but people don't know that. They don't think about that. Their focus is on what's wrong. You focus, yeah. I told you every reason why you should not even try at 21. You're 10 years behind. You're gonna break bones. It's the most <laughs> You focus on the fact too tough for them, just right for me, because I am the bulldog. I lock jaw on something <laughs> that I want and I'm not gonna let go. You're telling me I'm breaking a bone? I have an opportunity to have a bone that's stronger than all the others? Because when a bone heals, <laughs> you have that extra bond. You're like, oh, great. So when you did break a bone, it's like, oh, this is six weeks that I get to upgrade my body to an even stronger bone than I had before. It'll never break in that same spot again because it's a super bone now. <laughs> Bring it's it true. So you looked at the yeah. positive, you looked at what benefits you were gonna derive, not at all the can'ts, shouldn'ts, won'ts, everything else that people focus on, which is why they're like, oh, that's just impossible. So here's another thing. Most people, they're, they're, there's probabilities and there's possibilities, okay? All right? 
So I was focused on it's possible, right? It's possible. Even if it's one out of a hundred, it's possible. But it might, you know, uh, most people focus on the probability. This guy was focusing on the probability and he was saying, you know, there's no way, right? But you know what? I can increase the possibility through my commitment, right? The more committed you are, the more the, the more likely that you're going to do it. But if you quit and you don't do anything, guess what? It just went down to zero. So as long as you're committed and you give it every, everything you have, if it's something that you really want and, and it's possible, right? Give it a shot, all right? After when I started going for the Vancouver Olympics, there were two camps of people out there. One camp, they thought, oh, piece of cake, you'll do it for sure, right? You're gonna win the gold medal, right? Because they thought attitude is everything. <laughs> and I said, look, man, no, I'll be happy to make it. What are your chances? And I would tell them, realistically, this is like three months before the Olympics, it's about 50-50, okay? It's about 50-50, they didn't like that, right? And there was this other group that said, why are you even trying? You're already a three-time Olympian. Uh, you talk about success. If you don't make it, it's going to look bad on your resume. I thought, are you nuts, man? And these were speakers, okay? A couple of speakers. I thought, if, if that's the way you think, you need to stop teaching people because you're hurting them, man. <laughs> so you just give it all you have. And if you make it, great. If you, if you don't, hey, you can't control that, right? And... Either way, you win, though, because by putting yourself through the struggle, that forces you to dig deep inside, and you start start finding gifts that you had that you didn't you know you had. Now you got them for the rest of your life, right? It's not about the, the you know, it's not about the, the the dream or the goal. It's about the person you become and its pursuit, right? And so, there's other group of people is that, 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 that say that you're being selfish, man. You're always going after your dream. Oh, really? Well, what are you doing? You're a, little, you know, you're a total expert on every TV show every day of the week, right? But you don't do anything. You're sitting on the couch all the time. You're not getting any better. I'm, I'm chasing my dream, but I'm becoming better. And now I have more to give everybody else. You, you're stagnant. <laughs> so, don't, so don't let little people talk you out of the, you know, of, of, of the big dream. Yeah. And you know what? It's like, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's such I mean, a negative connotation. That's, uh, selfish. But the truth of the matter is there's only one person that can live your life. Like only Ruben Gonzalez can live Ruben Gonzalez's life. I can't be, you know, inside your body, in your brain, experiencing your life. I can have a vicarious experience and have, you know, incredible amount of joy and be uplifted and encouraged and empowered hearing your story and relating to a lot of the elements, but only you can actually live that. And that's true for all of us. And so there is a certain part of us that when you have the yeah, courage, yeah. That you actually faced It doesn't courage. understand. Yeah. I don't understand. You had the courage to make the decisions to become successful. To I am. Um, Olympics. And in doing so, you were selfish. You were turning inward to what your heart really desired. But in doing so, because you were able to overcome your fear yeah. of yourself, look at the incredible gift, all the lives. That kid right now that you, that you um, posted on Facebook, I'm going to find the picture and I'll include it in here. That kid would have not probably <laughs> a pilot and probably would not be doing what he does for a living now had he not read your book and then followed you. That's a life. Yeah. yeah. And you know what, uh, what's even cooler than that? Scott Hamilton, Scott Hamilton doesn't even know because he's responsible. Right. And there's somebody, there's somebody that inspired Scott Hamilton. Right. Absolutely. And there's probably somebody that inspired that guy. All right. Or right. So Scott wins the gold medal. He inspires me. Right. And now I become Scott Hamilton for, for other people. And now this kid, he's going to do something amazing, right? And 30 years from now or 20 years from now, he's going to be inspiring other people. And they never heard about me because, you know, but it doesn't matter. It's the ripple effect, right? It, it's it's it pretty is. cool. <laughs> and, but think about it. It's like passing the torch. It is passing You know, when you're, well, I, I was a torchbearer. I was a torch. Yeah. 
So I saw the face and I got my picture with the guy that handed me the torch, right? Because we were together and photo op, blah, blah, blah. And then I ran and I passed it on to somebody else. And so I connected with that person. We got some pictures, but we don't know the other 10,500 people, right? But if, you know, if it was the torch, the torch is, uh, you know, helping somebody reach their goal, teaching them, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it keeps and, you up at night. <laughs> well, yeah. And the thing is that, um, you know, they say that it's, you know, life is not a destination. It's the journey because you legitimately had a lot of benefits. Of course, that's not to say you didn't have a lot of blood, sweat and tears from the training that you had to do in order to become an Olympian, not once, not twice, but four times in four different decades. But that mental process, that state, the way of living, that's something that you, you still carry with you to this day. You have that bulldogged tenacity. You have the mental <laughs> mastery. You have the state control to succeed. I don't care what kind of economic climate, what kind of climate in any state. state control. Country. Very good. Oh, I'm glad yeah, you mentioned that. Nobody talks about that. But that's, that's huge for athletes. That's, that's everything. When you said... Your um, the coach that pointed out to you that the luge was not a sport of speed, but it was of beating a certain time. And you said that you had fear here. He's like, how could you have fear after being in three Olympics? You said you had fear, you know, you would see the speed of the walls and then you, again, self mastery, mind control, state control. You decided to relax as you relaxed biophysically you're allowing heart yeah. and brain coherence you're better. so because you're allowing heart and brain coherence you are no longer in fight or flight you don't have tension you don't have dissonance in your body guess what your speed you, you say it's so purdy i just i, I just kind of blab it out so <laughs> I, no, that's good I, it's good i like it i like it i like to lace in the so, medical the bio no, no, i like it because you you uh, unpack i i i spew stuff and then you unpack it really neat uh in sports your mental state right your arousal level you're either too loose or you're too tight or you're just right okay it's like the three bears so you're either too loose so you're playing ping pong but it could be tennis it could be any sport when i'm playing ping pong and it's natural now i don't even have to it's, i don't even have to think about it right but if i start losing some points and i uh, i'll immediately go to okay what what state level am I at, right? Am I too loose or am I too tight, okay? If I'm too loose, that means I don't care, right? Uh, I don't care, I'm making stupid mistakes, right? I'm making uh, uh, unforced errors because I don't care. So what do I do? Come on, Ruben, come on. I just get mad at myself a little, come on, focus, right? And that, that's all, that's like my little anchor and, and now that tightens me up a little bit. Now I'm, now I'm more in my zone. On the other hand, if I'm too tight, right? Maybe I'm making stupid mistakes as I'm a little bit too tight. Same thing. I'm losing these points and I, I go to, okay, what am I doing? Oh, I'm tight. Okay. Breathe. <sighs> slow it down. Slow it down. Slow down the points in between. And you see tennis players doing this all the time. If you're winning, if you're winning, right? What do you do? You speed up the game because you got the, the, uh, your opponent you know, on the ropes, right? And, and, and they're off their, their, their best state. So you speed it up to get as many points as you can. But if you're, if you're losing, what do you do? You have to slow it down, slow it down. Give yourself time to find that proper state again. Get yourself to where you need to be, right? And that's why you see them bouncing the ball and they'll go and they'll wipe themselves with a, with a towel and they'll do something else. And then finally they get, you know, the, 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 the umpire says, hey, come on, you're wasting time. And so now they, they play, but they're, they're, they're trying to give themselves time to get themselves back into that state where peak performance, right? And this, this stuff doesn't just apply to ping pong. You have to do a presentation, right, in front of people. You have to, you finally got the, uh, the chairman of the board on the phone. Uh, you get what your state is going to determine your performance, right? And so you have to be, you know, on top of it, right? When I'm walking up the stage, I here's a couple of things I do. I mean, before, if if there's an opportunity, there's not always an opportunity to do this, but if there is, like, there's a little break before my my 
my turn to talk, I'll walk across the whole front row. You know, there's all the tables, and I'll just go table by table. Hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm your speaker today, man. We're going to have a good time. I got a crazy Olympic story. We're going to have so much fun. And they love it, right? Because I just came up to them and said hello. And now, if it's a bad crowd, I can look at anybody on that front row, and they're just smiling at me and nodding my head, and they're fueling me, and I'm keeping me in my proper place, right? I, I call it making friendlies, right, before the, before the talk. And um, as I'm walking up to the, to the stage, I always say the same thing to myself. You know, we're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time, right? And, um, and, and so if you have fun, you're always going to, you know, you, 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 you're in a good state, right? You're going you're gonna to perform better. And I always start my presentation with the same word, right? People always ask me, what's it feel like? What does it feel like to hurl yourself at an icy shoot at 80, 90 miles an hour? Is it scary? And so, man, 10 seconds into that, I'm already in my groove. If I had butterflies, man, they're flying in formation now because I started the same way. The rest of my talk could be 20 different ways, but it always starts the same way to get me, you know, flowing. So I love- And to flow. I love the fact that you shared your process because in neurosomatics uh, and in like I'm a certified hypnotist. And one of the things that you're doing is you're anchoring a behavior so that you have a certain state control as you move forward. So you're following, your body is now cued. It's like, oh, we know, what, we know what's coming next. So you automatically go into the last time you did that. And that's why you're able to like stack the level of success that you have. Because neurosomatically, your brain has a certain neuroplasticity and it's going, okay, we got to, We've been down this road before. It's dive, It's actually making a deeper groove in your brain so that you succeed more and more and more because this is a positive outcome for you. Yeah. It can work in the negative, but you're using it for your benefit. Yeah, yeah. So I know you're a hypnotist. So the, my boxer friend is a hypnotist too. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, I've known him for almost 20 years. And he, uh, probably, I have no idea what time it is, but I better might want to start winding it down after the story because I could go, you probably figured out I go for days. Okay. I mean, four Olympics, that's a lot of experiences, that's a lot, a lot of, of stories. stories, but, um, I'm trying to make the Vancouver Olympics. I mean, yeah, the Vancouver Olympics. And there's five races that I need to do really well in to get the points that I need to hopefully make it. Top 40 are going to go in, not the top 50. I was always around 45 in the world. But now it's going to be top 40. They keep making it smaller and smaller because they keep adding sports to, to, to the Olympics, right? But they want to keep it at 3,000 athletes. They're turning it to the X Games. So if you 3,000 athletes, but we've got 10 more sports, there's less people per sport. So it's tougher, right? So I'm going for a goal that I've never even been there. You know, I've never been so good. But why not? Why not? Right? Why not me? And so one of the races is going to be in Lillehammer. And I've never been to that track before. And so I went a month before to get some training and a little hammer Norway and coming out of curve 13, I don't know if it's an optical illusion or what the heck it is, but you come out of curve 13 and it looks like you're going to hit the wall. Right. And, and I would do this little, just like that. It's like a little hiccup, right? Like I, like I'm, you're scared. And yeah. that was enough to send me into a skid and then I, and then I would fix it, but I lost all this time. Right. And coach would say, Ruben, you know, what's wrong with you, man? You're, you're, your line out of 13 is fine. What are you doing on the, on the, on the, on, in the transition? And he's like, I thought I was going to hit the wall. He goes, well, that's just an optical illusion. Don't look at that. Well, this is the coach that doesn't know how to get in my head, right? He just, so, so he's not really helping me. And so then that evening we watch it on videos because they always videotape you so you can analyze afterwards. And uh, he says, see, look, your lines, man, are really good. But then you go into that skid. And I couldn't. It was a, it was a block. It was just a block, right? So I come back, back home, and I go straight to Don, Don Akers. He's my – look up Don, D-O-N-A-K-E-R-S.com. He's, he's good. And so I went – I told him, hey, this is what's going on. He goes, okay, well, why don't you just come on over, bring your sled. We'll, we'll figure it out. So we put the sled in the living room, and he says, okay, uh, I'm going to have you do, you know, visualization runs. And I'm going to ask you the same thing about 20 different ways because I don't know which one's going to elicit the, you know, get the information out of your subconscious mind. Okay, so bear with me. Said, yeah, no problem. So we're doing them. He keeps asking me basically what's going on. What are you thinking, right, when you're going through there? 
And he goes, okay, don't go from the top. This is curve 13. Once you start on curve 10, and we'll just go from there. And I'm coming off of 13. And I goes, okay, what are you thinking? Here it comes. What, what are you thinking? Here it comes. Are you serious? He goes, yeah. Well, you're being totally reactive, man. You're going to be proactive, okay? From now on, it's going to be here I come, okay? Here I come. That's your new mantra, all right? I put it on my bookmarks. I put a little sign for my steering wheel. Here I come, everything, right? Because I have two weeks. I got to go back to – I even, I still have some of those – those uh, those. Oh, hang on. I got to show you this. I still have some of those bookmarks that say here I come because he said you're going to stick it to the track, not the other way around. And so oh, this is my sled. This is one of them. So, there's a sled, right? Oh. Now, I'm sitting down on the sled, looking that way at the uh -huh. start, right? Waiting, waiting my turn, okay? Uh-huh. All right. So, if you're sitting on the sled, you're facing this way, right? Yeah. So, what do you see there? Here, Here I come. come. Smile. Smile. Breathe. Have fun. Wow, I love that. Yeah, my that's the last thing in my mind before every single run. So I go back to Lillehammer, no problem. And I, and, and I did well, right? Wow. Because he knew how to get in my head. Ain't that, isn't that cool? And he loves, he says, Ruben, you, <laughs> you're my best student, man, because I just tell you something and you just do it. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, but it's because I trust you, you know? I trust, yeah. I trust you. But that's how the subconscious mind works. Uh, it really is fascinating. And by the way, I did find the post that you had here on Facebook. There is the young. Ah, uh, good. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Anton. Anton. Yeah. What is his name? I could read it really quick. Anton. It says, it, um, no matter what you do for a living, you touch people in one way or another. My favorite restaurants are the ones where the owner comes to our table and chats with us for a few minutes. By the way, if you're in Boulder, Colorado, and you have lunch at Ring Kong, Argentina, Christian, the owner, will do just that. He's friends with all diners. I just received an email from Anton Zugar, an aviation student in Russia. He read my book a while back and was inspired to pursue his aviation dream. As you can imagine, it made my day. I invited Anton to our group. If he joins, let, let's all make him feel welcome. Here's the note in his own words. Hello, Ruben, my name is Anton. I'm from Russia. First of all, I wanna say thank you so much. I read your book, The Courage to Succeed, and I really liked it. I started to read it more than one year ago, and for that time, I had a dream to become a pilot of civil aviation. I visualized me in the cabin. I went through a lot of obstacles and your book helping me to do that. And now from a lot of time working, I'm studying in Yulianaskov Institute of Civil Aviation. Right now I want to read your book one more time and take a look of your request to write to you a message. So I really liked your book and I think that it's the best book I've ever read. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, because I write. Yeah, that's cool, huh? So I, in my book, uh, it says in the introduction of all my books, I say, look, when you start getting victories, right, because of the things you learn here, email me because your victories will fuel my victories. All right. And that's exactly what's going on right now. I mean, that kid just super, supercharged me. All right. And so, so it's cool. It's cool. So I, um, I go, I, I race, I, I, I did well. But I, I, only the top 40 are going to make it to Vancouver. And at the end of the qualification, I'm number 42, okay? December 31st, that's the add up the last two years. And the Olympics are in February. So you quit, okay? No, you don't quit, you know? Just because they, they won't fund your loan, no, you don't quit. You figure something out, right? <laughs> and so in January... I went to uh, the, the track in Vancouver is the fastest in the world. The second fastest is the one in, in Park City, Utah. So all of January, I was in Park City just getting some speed training just in case, right? You, you know, back in, the, uh, back in the Calgary Olympics, the guy that was supposed to win, Norbert Hoover from, from Italy, he goes and gets appendicitis two weeks before the Olympics. He missed the Olympics and he was never back to that level, oh. right? talk about bad luck and so i 
thought, okay, well, somebody could break a leg. Somebody gets in a car crash. I need three people to get in a car crash. I'm number 42 in the world. I got to be in the top 40. <laughs> so if something happens, I need to be prepared. So I'm going to be, you know, you have to be prepared. So I'll be speed training in Park City. And three weeks before the Olympics, I get this email that, that said, you made it. Norway decided not to send their three guys who had qualified, okay? But if you're Norway, Norway has such a rich Winter Olympic heritage, they go to win, right? So if you're from Norway, they won't send you unless you're top 20, Yeah. okay? So these three guys were not top 20. That bumped me up to 39th, and I got to go to the Olympics. At the closing, at the opening ceremonies, I want to carry the, the, the Norwegian flag. They held me more than anybody. I'll show you one last thing before we got to go. Wow. And just to show you, okay? Because I got little tricks, I, you know, to, to help me do what I know I need to do to, mm -hmm. to God reach always my goal. gives you a way. You said earlier, God always gives you a way. And sure yeah. enough, he gave you Yeah, a way. but, you know, yeah, but. Yes. God put, I believe that God puts a dream in your heart, okay? But it's not gonna fall in your lap, okay? You have to go out and get it. And he, he does that because, it's, it's like a carrot in front of a horse or a, a mule, right? It's on a carrot on a stick to make him go different places. So that's, God uses that to make us do all that hard stuff that's gonna make us better, right? Because it's all about the person you become, right? <laughs> and so it's not gonna fall in your lap, all right? See, I, I, I went to, you know, um, to uh, get speed training. If, if, if I'd have made it and, and, and I wasn't ready, I probably would have killed myself. One kid killed himself on that track the day before the, our race, it was terrible. But I wanna show you something. Yeah, that's my little Nespresso machine, right, that I see every morning. But look what's next to it. That's a Norwegian flag, okay, you know why? That's, that's so I don't get a fat head. I'm a fourth time Olympian, thanks to these guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little Norwegian. <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> yeah, so. Wow. Yeah, I don't want, you know, hey, I got a little help, right? So, anyways. But hey, so, this was fun. This was fun. This was spectacular. Things always have a way of working themselves out for the best. I think this is great. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, render this and then we can put it on your Facebook page and we can maybe try again a next time for doing this again. Maybe not next Friday because next Friday is Black Friday and we have Thanksgiving, but maybe the following <laughs> Friday. Yeah. And, uh, and then maybe we'll do a simulcast to YouTube and or Facebook so that um, it's more easy for people to, you know, get on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And Sid wants to do one too. You just beat him to the punch, but Sid okay. has this amazing um, and, Maybe we need to promote it better. It's, um, I'm, I'm surprised nobody got on. There was this one lady that was on for a little while and she got off. Yeah, um, a couple of them. I think maybe they saw that it was because we, you know, we had to morph it again. Things have a way of working themselves out for the best. And since it was just you and I, we didn't have yeah. to do the meet and greet because you and I already know each other. But we will promote <laughs> it as a meet and greet. And I really want everybody to do like a two minute elevator speech of, you know, what they do, where they do it. And yeah fact about themselves and a problem that they solve and whatever service or product that they provide. And then that way yeah. we can get however many people we have on, everybody has an opportunity to say sure. and um, participate because that was the intention yeah. of this meet and greet. Yeah. So Sid has this um, technology. It's really expensive. I, I, I looked at it and I thought, no way. Um, it's like Zoom, but it's all these tables, right? And you actually see it's like a, it's, it's, it, there's a, the, the two speakers are up at the top and it can change. But then you see, a, it's like a, like the plan of a ballroom and you see all the little circles, which are tables. And those are like rooms, right? And so before it's like a networking party because he, he runs networking groups. And so they will, uh, they all hang out for about half an hour and you can see who's at the different tables, right? Because you can, you, you can, um, hover over and it tells you the bios of all the different people. And so you know what table you might want to go to and you just go into that room and you guys are chatting. And sometimes he has like a different topic for each table. Hey, you guys talk about these things and then whatever. And then he'll, and, and then he brings a speaker for you know 30 minutes or whatever. And then they go back to just to hang out. Right. And he says, sometimes he can't shut it off because the, the, you know, people are just wanting to hang out there all day. 
but apparently the it, it's it's the closest thing to a live networking event, but uh, very expensive. So uh, he wants to do that with us um, sometime. Okay, cool. yeah, that sounds interesting. It'll be great to see. There, there's so much incredible talent and so so many incredible things that are going on right now. This is not the time to be sitting on your hands doing nothing. This is this is a time where you can really as you have talked about so eloquently, we can really get quantum results. Once you start to really focus on what it is that you want, focus on what you can do, because we can reach even more people by doing things virtually than we could flying all over the world. Yeah. Patients, you know, there's nothing that beats a face-to-face in person where you can, you know, handshake, feel the warmth of another person's palm, look them straight in the eye. But short of that, you know, there is no limit to how many people we can impact. That kid in Russia, Anton, he's a world away, read your book, took inspired action, and now he's a civil aviation uh, pilot. Yeah, like a commercial pilot. Yeah, that's what he's going for. Yeah, he's a commercial aeronautic engineer. So it's incredible. So really impact and improve a lot of people's lives. And again, the message is to everyone, people who participate on this and people who are viewing this later, I'll, I'll be sure to put this on my YouTube channel as well, because who knows who will be inspired by your story. You never know who's there. You never know. One of, one of the guys in our, in our group, Cess, Cess Guerra, uh, he's a um, realtor in Houston. When I was just getting started, oh, man, here's another story. <laughs> when I was just getting started speaking, um, there's this club in Houston, it's called the Houstonian. And that's like, you know, if you belong to the Houstonian, you know, you, you, you got to be, you, you got money. And I was uh, invited to speak at a, at a they were going to have a, a networking event. Oh, yeah, we usually have 100, 200 people. It's going to be great, Ruben. I thought, well, 100, 200, these are decision makers, right? Awesome. So I go, and there were six, okay, six people. And as soon as I walked in there with that, with, with six people, I remember something that Michael Jordan had said, you know, he said, even if it's the first game of the season, I play like it's the finals, right? Because there's probably a few kids there that are only going to see me once in their life, and I want them to see, remember me at my best, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I went in with that attitude. Right? I'm, I'm going to Michael Jordan these six people. And I just went all out. And Cess, before he was a realtor at the time, he was a pharmaceutical sales guy for AstraZeneca, right? He sold pharmaceuticals. And he got so fired up. We finished at 1030 at night. He got so fired up, he called his boss's boss when he got home. And he says, man, I'm ready to run through walls, man. We need to bring this guy in to speak for us. And, and I got two gigs at a big pharma company because I wasn't a, you know, a jerk because we only had five. You never know who's there. And then we became friends and we climbed Kilimanjaro together. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> you climbed Kilimanjaro together? Yeah, yeah, we had a group with Greg Reed. Greg and I put a group together. He was one of the guys, and, and you know, so uh, you never know. So that's why, you know, this was potentially going to be a bunch of people, but, hey, uh, we're going to do – there's a reason that it was just you and me, all right? Yeah. And there's a reason that those two coffee shops were sh- closed down this morning, and Matthew and I ended up doing that little tour video, which is so much fun, and put a head, you know, idea in my head saying, hey, I had so much fun doing that. Maybe I should just go to all the local businesses and shoot some videos about entrepreneurs, you know, and post them just for kicks. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and again, it's that mindset, that attitude that it doesn't matter whether only one shows up or none um, or many. It, it's, you still show up with the same attitude. You don't get down and out. Um, Dr. David Snyder, who um, he's basically the key, the key man at the San Diego Hypnosis Institute, and he says that one of his first um, meetups when he was first, you know, beginning to teach not only hypnosis, but regression technologies and NLP and all sorts of other things. The very first one he did, he only had one person that showed up and he's like, okay, well, it doesn't matter that only one person showed up again, that mental resolve, that mental <laughs> attitude. He gave that guy a hundred percent of what he had. And um, I don't remember right now if that guy was a producer or if he was the head of some sort of medical school. It turned out that it was an influential person. And, but he didn't know that. He just knew that sure. he only knew he had one attendee. And, you know, 
From that, he ended up having to this day, I mean, right now we're in lockdown with COVID and so forth, so we don't have meetups anymore, but he has the largest hypnosis meetup in the world. Wow. And he is <laughs> number one um, voted by his peers all over the world. He is the number one hypnotist. And, and he's got, he's a doctor of oriental medicine, of acupuncture. He has more degrees, um, certification, wow. master Reiki healer. He's a 12th degree, fourth degree. He has like four or five black belts. One's 12th degree, fourth degree. I mean, it goes on and on and he on. He doesn't sleep. That guy doesn't sleep. Guy, you, know, he's, <laughs> he just, you know, he's, you know, he's a peak performer like yourself, but it's that mental resolve that it's like, okay. One person shows up, I give it my all. No one shows up, I'm still going to, you know, I'm going to make, because he records everything. And so, but everybody has to start somewhere. Everybody has to start somewhere. Yeah. And if that attitude is good enough for Michael Jordan, it's good enough for me. I mean, that's. I, don't, I can't tell you the number of people you know, I've heard who said, I want to start a YouTube channel, but I'm afraid of this. I'm not sure that I look good, that I don't have enough. I don't have any followers yet. I'm like, well, if you don't get on YouTube and start creating content, you're never going to have any followers. And it's not about the followers. It's about having joy and sharing your area of expertise, your gift, your journey that will uplift and encourage and empower others. As you do that, you're going to get better at sharing your story, you know, framing it in the right way. And the right people will come, you know, just like, just like our club. I, I don't want big i want big numbers of the right people right <laughs> exactly and then don't worry about like you didn't directly say this but you you um, alluded to this a bit that you know you don't focus on what you don't want you don't focus on the naysayers people that tell you you can't it's like you're 21 you're 10 years behind the curve you can't do that you're like ah. that was like it didn't even blip on your radar because you're a bulldog so <laughs> like when you get on your on social media of any form, anybody who is a naysayer, who's ranting negatively, don't engage, don't comment, don't read it over and over again. Oh, no. Just delete. Yes, amen. Yep. Yeah. Great. He's written over. No, no, no. And, 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 and that's. The same thing. Don't listen yep. to the negative. The people who want to knock you down that are hiding behind um, elusive uh profiles that they don't even have the gall to show their face and they're gonna rant negative stuff on you rain on your parade why would you care just delete them next no no and you know what this is interesting i had when i was early in the days of speaking if i had a guy that was not paying attention right or look sleepy or whatever i you know i it was like my mission in life i'm gonna i'm gonna this guy needs motivation and i would ignore all the ones that actually like me right which is totally wrong the opposite. and then we had a baby let's see when i uh, gabby was probably a year and a half old when i got started yeah and so i remember one time uh gabby kept me up all night because she was sick so i didn't get any sleep that night and i had to go I had to, I had to go uh, as, to this meeting as an audience member, right? And the guy was really good. Okay, he was. It was a class I'd signed up for. It was a computer class, which is pretty boring stuff. But he was so good that he made it interesting. But I was so tired because I didn't sleep that night. I just kept nodding off. You know, I thought, oh my gosh. And then I realized, oh my gosh. He probably thinks I don't like what he's talking about, but I'm just tired because Gabby kept me up. Right. And so next time I get somebody that's not into it, just zone them out, focus on the ones that are smiling. Right. Cause that's where I'm gonna get my energy from. Again, so. focus back on what you want. I think that's so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Ruben for um, being willing to do this and I'll let you know as soon as I have this rendered and We'll see yeah, just post it. Don't even let me know. Just post it and we'll see it when it comes up. Okay. And then we'll schedule you for being on my show. I want Whenever. you to talk about intuition and about, because that book that I'm writing also, The Friendship Oracle. So I want to have you on the show huh. specifically about that. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Take All care. Right. Take good care. seeing you. Bye-bye.